1998. The U.S. Embassy is bombed in Nairobi, Kenya. The Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal hits the news headlines. The International Space Station was launched. Google was incorporated as a private company, and Apple released the first iMac. The world gathered in Nagano, Japan for the Winter Olympics, and then in France for the World Cup. France taking home the honors in their home country. The Yankees win 114 games, the most of any team in 92 years, and they win the World Series. John Elway finally wins his first Super Bowl as the Broncos beat the Packers. The Red Wings took home the Stanley Cup, and Michael Jordan won his sixth and final NBA championship with the Chicago Bulls. Titanic wins Best Picture, Sean Colvin wins Song of the Year with Sonny Came Home, and Britney Spears became a household name with Baby One More Time. 1998 was an interesting year in the theme park industry. The coaster wars were about to hit their climax, and the biggest players in the industry were making major moves. These are the events that changed the theme park industry in 1998. Not every story was top 10 worthy. Here's the best of the rest. And now for the top 10. October 29th, 1998. Cedar Point unveiled their plans for the 1999 season, and that included Snoopy setting up camp in the new kids area. This would be right across from Gemini, and there would be a brand new family coaster to join Junior Gemini, Woodstock Express. This would be the start of a whole new movement across the Cedar Fair chain. Adding Camp Snoopy or Planet Snoopy to just about all their parks, or using Snoopy as a symbol of their parks, the same way Six Flags used Bugs Bunny or Disney used Mickey Mouse. This was all made possible by Cedar Fair's acquisition of Knott's Berry Farm at the tail end of 1997, acquiring the rights to use the Peanuts franchise along with the park. Their Camp Snoopy dating back to 1983. Cedar Fair saw this IP as extremely valuable for their parks, as they lacked an identity with a universally known character. The Peanuts comic strip was the most popular and widely read across the world. June 22, 1998. Universal buys a majority stake in Port Aventura, a park in Salou, Spain, spearheaded by Anheuser-Busch in the early 90s and opening in 1995. This was the first time Universal had ventured into Europe, and they chose a good one. Just three years into its life, it was already the most popular park in Spain, attracting 3 million people a year. Right away, Universal would rebrand the park as Universal's Port Aventura, taking over operations and management. This was an ambitious project, and Universal was already stretched thin, about to debut Islands of Adventure in Orlando and getting work started on Universal Studios Japan. Universal managed the park well, winning awards for its live entertainment, adding two hotels and a water park in 2002, calling the complex Universal Mediterranean. But by 2004, this park and other parks in Spain were having problems. Port Aventura losing millions of dollars by that point, attendance not meeting its projected goals, and Universal sold all its shares. The Universal name was dropped and the park went back to being known as Port Aventura, finding success in the two decades since the sale. Ever since 1967, Disneyland had the People Mover in their Tomorrowland section. This would give guests a tour of the land, using a track elevated over the footpaths. It was closed in 1995 for something more modern, this new ride being deemed Rocket Rods. This was supposed to be the drag race of the future, the headline attraction to the new Tomorrowland to give a more updated version of the future. May 22, 1998. Rocket Rods opened to the public, and right away, guests seemed confused. It was too fast to be a tour ride, but too slow to be a thrill ride. More important, this ride was plagued with mechanical problems. Reusing the People Mover track, they found the structure was not made for the higher speeds and heavier cars of Rocket Rods. 
Because of that, they made it go fast on the straight track and slow on the curves. That constant change of speed wore the wheels down fast and caused other mechanical issues. July 6, 1998. Rocket Rods is shut down to address the myriad of problems. Instead of a five-week project, it turned out to be three months, not reopening until October. Disney got the ride working well enough, but less than two years later, it was shut down for refurbishment and never reopened. Rocket Rods remains one of the worst ideas of all time. December 19, 1998. Test Track soft opens to the public at Disney's Epcot. The ride was meant to take riders through the various test runs of a GM vehicle, the climax being a 65 mile an hour ride around the outside of the building. This was announced in 1995, set to take place the old world of motion. This was supposed to open in May of 1997, but that got pushed to October, and 1998 came around and it was still not open. Summer came and went, and in August, Disney announced the ride would be delayed once again. Right before the year ended, they finally opened a very buggy ride to the public, still working out the problems, not officially opening until March of 1999. They had issues with the wheels. They had issues with the ride software. They wanted 29 cars on the track, but at first the ride could only handle 6. That required a complete reprogramming. On the day of its soft opening, they sent out two cars and then had a two hour breakdown. This ride was an absolute nightmare from the start, but it did give Epcot a thrilling ride, and over time it started running smoother and smoother. To this day, it's one of the most popular rides at Epcot. In 1968, Marine World opened as a zoo in Redwood City, California, moving to a new location in Vallejo in 1986. This park was all about the animals, not rides. But after the owners defaulted on their debt in 1996, the city of Vallejo took over. They would turn to premier parks to not just manage the park, but to make it better. Their method was to add more non-animal attractions. They started this process in 1997, and by 1998, they had two major coasters. Kong, a Vacoma suspended looping coaster, and Boomerang Coast to Coaster, a Vacoma Boomerang. This would coincide with a name change, the new Marine World theme park. Indeed, this zoo was now a theme park, and over the past 25 years, they've seen 15 different coasters open up, making it one of the bigger parks in the country. In 1979, a fake mountain called the Lost World was built at King's Dominion. This was the home to multiple attractions over the years, the latest being Smurf Mountain between 1984 and 1993, but that lost popularity and was shut down. As soon as Paramount acquired the park around the same time, they wanted to do something different with this mountain. In 1996, Paramount asked Intamin to build a launch coaster, something Intamin had never done before, and they wanted it to be inverted, something nobody had ever done before. July 22, 1997. King's Dominion announces Volcano the Blast Coaster, a $20 million ride, launching riders up and out the top of a fake mountain, now fashioned as a volcano. This used an LIM launch, technology that had just been introduced the year prior, one of the pioneers being King's Dominion's very own Flight of Fear. Still, it was new and it had a lot of problems, especially trying to gain enough speed to get up and out the top of the volcano. The opening date kept getting pushed back, the park announced it would open on July 6, but that was scrapped also. August 1st, 1998. Volcano soft opens to the public, taking measures to prevent rollbacks, front loading the trains and leaving the back empty. After two very successful days, it had its official opening on August 3rd, becoming the headline attraction at King's Dominion and the most popular ride until its sudden closure in 2018. In 1989, Disney MGM Studios marked Disney World's third park, but Michael Eisner and the Disney officials knew they weren't done yet. Right away, they went exploring for their fourth park, and in 1995, they made the official announcement. Their wild animal kingdom would range between $600 and $800 million, sending their Imagineers to Africa and Asia to inspire them to landscape the park. They would collect seeds from around the world to make it more authentic, collecting animals to populate the park starting in 1997 hiring away staff from other zoos to start working for Disney. April 22nd, 1998. Animal Kingdom opened to the public, its main attraction being the Kilimanjaro Safaris, a long truck ride into the animal habitat. It also had the 3D theater show, It's Tough to Be a Bug, and the motion simulator dark ride, Dinosaur. 
26 years later, this remains the newest park on the Disney World property, adding some amazing attractions since 1998. Expedition Everest in 2006, and Pandora, the World of Avatar in 2017, home to one of the most revered Disney attractions, Flight of Passage. Animal Kingdom remains in the top 10 most visited parks in the world. In the early 90s, Busch Gardens was looking to add a looping coaster to each of their parks. Apparently, they called B&M to get both jobs done, but with two stand-up coasters set to open, plus the first inverted coaster in the works. They said they could deliver one coaster for 1993, but not two. Busch Gardens agreed to have B&M build Kuma for their Tampa park, and turned to Aerodynamics for Williamsburg. That company already having built Loch Ness Monster and Big Bad Wolf, and they took what B&M had drawn up and tried to do it themselves. This caused Arrow to step outside their comfort zone, and safe to say, it did not work. It had a totally different support structure, tall tubular columns instead of the crossbeam lattice. The one and only arrow to have a cobra roll, a wraparound corkscrew midway down the first drop. And it used to have a corkscrew after the mid-course break run, but that was taken out after just three seasons. This ride had a very short honeymoon, seen by many as too rough just a month after it opened. Some riders even going to the hospital after having neck pain. Ride operators would check riders for clip-on earrings and ask them to take them out. By 1997, the ride was already starting to fade away. Alpengeist had just opened and that was taking all of Dragonfire's ridership away. And in July 1998, there were reports of a rider suffering a brain injury, so the ride was closed indefinitely. Between the problems with the track running rough, plus rumored legal problems, and the ride's popularity disappearing, also a new B&M hypercoaster already under construction on the other side of the park. Once the ride closed, it didn't make any sense to ever reopen it. The park did announce intentions to fix the ride going into 1999, and the ride was listed for sale for months, but they couldn't reach a deal. This would stand idle until 2002 when it was torn down and recycled, 10 years after it was built and 4 years since it last operated. And this ended the saga of one of the most infamous coasters ever built. March 14th, 1998. Secret Weapon 4 is unleashed on Alton Towers. Oblivion stands 65 feet tall, but it drops into a tunnel going down 115 feet a 180-foot drop in total, and this marked the first attempt at a coaster with a vertical drop. Before Oblivion, the steepest drop was on the Togo Ultra Twister model, 85 degrees. Nothing else had ever cracked 80 degrees. Because the train lacked spring-loaded wheels, the drop couldn't be a true vertical drop. It maxed out at 87.5 degrees, but building a coaster with a long drop straight down was revolutionary, and it paved the way for a bunch of other manufacturers to start going vertical. In 2003, Gerschlauber took it to the next level by going beyond vertical, and manufacturers just keep pushing that limit. Oblivion was also a one-trick pony, having the drop and it turned back to the station. And since then, we've seen vertical and beyond vertical drops followed by elite layouts. Oblivion gets credit as being the father of the vertical drop, without ever having a vertical drop. April 1st, 1998. Time Warner sells his interest in Six Flags. The buyer was Premier Parks, an up-and-coming chain of parks, starting as the Tierco Group in 1984. At this point, the Six Flags chain had eight parks, three built from the ground up, over Texas, over Georgia, and St. Louis, plus the five it acquired, Great Adventure, Astroworld, Magic Mountain, Great America, and Fiesta Texas. This acquisition by Premier Parks would more than double the amount of parks in the chain, they bragged that 150 million Americans would be less than 100 miles from a Six Flags park. The properties they brought on included Geauga Lake, Kentucky Kingdom, Elitch Gardens, Frontier City, Wild World, Riverside Park, Marine World, Darien Lake, and Great Escape. Despite Premier acquiring Six Flags, they chose to use the Six Flags name to market the parks already in their portfolio. They added Six Flags in front of Kentucky Kingdom, Elitch Gardens, Marine World, and Darien Lake. They would also change the name of Wild World, now known as Six Flags America. More important than their name, Premier Parks would launch into an aggressive pattern of investment, announcing $80 million for those five parks alone. This included an intimate hypercoaster for Darien Lake, a GCI wooden coaster for Marine World, and two new coasters for Six Flags America, a Premier Rides launch coaster for the adults, and a Zamperla gravity coaster for the kids. Premier Parks may have been taking a backseat to the Six Flags brand, but they were fully in control of the future of the chain, and they wanted to add as much as possible, as fast as possible. 
After this acquisition, Six Flags had 115 coasters under their purview, while Paramount only had 37 and Cedar Fair 33. That gap would only get bigger. This acquisition in 1998 led to two of the most insane years we've ever seen in the coaster industry. Adding more than 20 coasters in 1999 and then doing it all again in 2000. They also added more parks along the way, including some outside the US. This was a tremendous period of excess for the chain. A period we are still benefiting from to this day, but also a period that ended up bringing down the chain. That's a wrap on 1998. If you have any thoughts on these events, or have anything else that you want to add, sound off in the comments below. Also, let me know of any theme park memories you have from 1998. I know a lot of you weren't even born back then, but for those who were, I'd like to hear what you remember. 1998 was not a big year for coasters for me. I was only 10 years old. I can't remember if it was 98 or 99 when I went to Knott's to ride Montezuma's Revenge for the first time, but I do remember marathoning the Santa Monica West Coaster that year. And at the time, that was about as big of a coaster as I could handle, and I credit that as my first coaster credit. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like. And if you're new here and want to see more content like this, please give me a sub. If you want to see other years in this series, I have a playlist with all the episodes. Also, check out my second channel where I post copyright-free off-ride footage, and my baseball channel if you're a baseball fan like me. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.